Well, good morning. Welcome to Stonebriar Community Church. It is certainly good to see all of you here and to our friends online. Welcome. We're glad you're here. You know, online folks, if you are in the area, we would love to invite you to take the next step and maybe join us here in person on Sunday. We'd love to meet you. Anyway, thanks everybody for being here. If you are new with us, uh, there's a couple of ways you can connect with us here at Stonebriar right away. First of all, in the seats in front of you, you'll see a little QR code. And if you scan that, that'll give you more information about us. And if you'd like to talk to somebody about Stonebriar and all the various ways you can connect, we've got some great folks at our information desk in the atrium. Feel free after the service to walk out there and speak with them. They'd be glad to meet you. Well, our senior pastor, Chuck, had an eye procedure last Wednesday. And when we asked him how he was doing, he emailed us back and he said, please let everyone know that the recovery is slowly taking place and the pain is pretty intense. However, I feel everyone's prayers and support, and I'm grateful for both. So I know you'll join all of us here on staff in praying for our senior pastor in the days ahead as he recovers from this, and we do look forward to his return next week. In the meantime, this morning, we are blessed again, privileged to have Dr. Jonathan Murphy bringing the message with us, uh, for us this morning. Jonathan, brother, thanks for being here. Will you all, once again, welcome back, Jonathan. I'd like to highlight a couple of things for all of us this morning. First of all, men, this is for you. Uh, one of the areas I oversee in ministry here is our men's ministry, and this coming weekend is our annual men's retreat. It's a great time. It's a highlight for many of us guys. I encourage you to go online. Today is the last day that you can register for that. J.R. Vassar will be our guest speaker, and our theme is defined. I love that word, defined. We're going to spend time learning about how the fact that God is the one who designed us, therefore he is the one who gets to define us. What does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be God's man in this world today? So it's going to be a great time. There's also lots of wonderful activities, horseback riding. Uh, I was really intrigued by archery tag. I don't know how that works, but <laughs> we're going to do it. So come on out, check it out. You might want to get your affairs in order before you come, but... <laughs> We look forward to a great time. Again, today is the last day you can register for that, so I encourage you to check out on our website, Men's Retreat, and sign up. And then next, our, our pastor of young adults, Joey Dean, has some exciting news about some new things coming up in the next week. So let's watch what he has to share on the video together. Hey, Stonebriar family. I'm Joey Dean, your pastor of young adult ministries. My goal is to make sure that every young adult here at Stonebriar has a place to call home. So today, I want to tell you about some of the opportunities we have for young adults to connect with one another and become disciple makers for Jesus. First, a key thing to know is that our programs for young adults fall into two distinct areas. The college ministry for ages 18 to 25, whether you're in school, working, or both, and our Young Professionals Ministry for those in their mid-20s to mid-30s. Now with that in mind, let's talk about what's coming up in both of those ministries. To start, we have a new Sunday Fellowship for Young Professionals that will begin meeting on October 1st. It's open to anyone in that mid-20s to mid-30s range who's looking for deep friendships, discipleship, and wisdom from God's Word. And then, we have a young adults Bible study on Wednesday nights that'll kick off on October 4th. This group is for both college age adults and young professionals, and it's a great place to have conversations about the Bible and discover what it means to live as followers of Jesus. We also have our ongoing College & Co. Sunday Fellowship, where college-age young adults gather to build relationships, dig into scripture, and make an impact on our community. To start getting connected, go to stonebriar.org slash youngadults. That's where you'll find all of the info on our groups. You'll be able to reach out to me, and you can sign up for text and email updates too. If you are a young adult, I'm so excited to get to know you and to be a part of what the Lord is doing in your life.
Believers, can you think of any other place that you'd rather be than in the presence of our loving Heavenly Father? Amen? Amen. 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 Contemporary author and musician Andrew Peterson directs our eyes and our hearts toward our eternal home with God. Recalling John the Revelator's desperation, asking, is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? And then he answers on our behalf, yes. The Lion of Judah who conquered the grave, he is David's root. And the Lamb who died to ransom the slave, our Jesus, he, he is worthy. And someday, my brothers and sisters, someday, the, the relationship that we had with our Father in his presence, unbroken relationship in the Garden of Eden. Someday we will walk with him and we will be in his presence in a very special way, never to be separated from him. The one who will make all things new, he is worthy. Stop the light from getting through. Do you wish that you could see it all made new? Is all creation groaning? Is a new creation coming? the glory of the Lord to be the light within the midst. Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able
He is worthy. He is worthy. <laughs> yes. Yes. He is worthy of our praise. And I believe that the heart of our God is honored when we as his people confess his word back to him. So would you join me as we look to that moment, that time to come, as we read from Revelation 21 together and saying, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is among the people and he will dwell among them and they shall be his people and God himself will be among them, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away, and he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things
That was beautiful. Our scripture reading this morning is from the book of Acts, chapter 14. And I will be reading, I hope, <laughs> from verses 8 to 20. Acts chapter 14, verses 8 to 20. And would you please stand together as I read from God's word this morning. In Lystra there sat a man who was lame. And he had been that way from birth and never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. And Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed. And he called out, stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of this, they tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd, shouting, Friends, why are you doing this? We, too, are only human like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. In the past, he let all nations go their own way, yet he has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their season. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. Even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back, excuse me, into the city. The next day, he and Barnabas left for Derby. Wow, what an account. You may be seated. Before I pray this morning, I want to let you know about the passing of a dear friend of Stonebriar and an opportunity we have to celebrate her life and legacy. On Friday, August 25th, Mary Graham passed into the presence of our Savior. Mary was one of the longtime speakers with Women of Faith. She was a faithful board member for over 35 years with Pastor Chuck's radio ministry, Insight for Living. She was best friends with Chuck's sister, Lucy, and she was a faithful part of our Stonebriar Church family. In fact, whenever the women of faith were speaking across the country, Mary always made sure she could fly home early Sunday morning so that she could be here and wouldn't miss worshiping with us. It's been said that you could impress people from a distance, but you impact them up close. Mary's life and ministry made an impact up close and personal. On behalf of our senior pastor, Chuck, and his wife, Cynthia, our church staff and congregation, we extend our heartfelt condolences to Mary's family. Friends, if you want to join us for a tribute to Mary Graham's life, you'll want to take note and perhaps write this down in two weeks on Saturday, October the 7th at 4 p.m. You were invited to join us here at Stonebriar as we celebrate together Mary Graham's life and legacy. We hope you can all join us. And now would you bow with me as I pray? Heavenly Father, we think right now of Mary Graham's passing and the combination of feelings that her family and friends are feeling right now, the loss, the grief of that, and yet the inexplicable joy of her home going to you. Father, I pray that you would comfort her family in memories shared and stories told, that you would comfort them through this time. 
We are grateful for her time that she had with us here at Stonebriar. Uh, Father, we pray for the men's retreat. We pray for changed lives. We pray for men to come to faith. We pray for hearts to be moved and drawn to you. Lord, we pray for the young adult ministry that we heard Pastor Joey speak about. We pray for these new classes launched next week. We pray that our young adults would be moved and drawn closer to you, Father, and challenged to live lives 100% for you. Father, we pray for our pastor. We pray for the continued healing of his eye. We pray that the medicines would do their job. Lord, you would bring him comfort. Even this morning, as we are praying for him, may he continue to sense our prayers, our love, and support as he gets well. Father, we thank you for our brother Jonathan. We pray for the message that he will bring us this morning, that you would give him liberty and freedom as he shares the word with us. May we be challenged by that truth. Father, we pray for our offering this morning. Uh, you are worthy, as we sang, of all blessing and honor and glory. Father, you are worthy of all our love, our devotion, our obedience, and our confession. You are worthy of our time. You are worthy of our possessions. You are worthy of our jobs, our families. You are worthy of it all. You are entirely and eternally worthy of our worship, and so we give to you just a small bit of all that you have given to us. Oh, Heavenly Father, you are truly worthy, and so we worship you now. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Well, good morning. It is great to be back. Thank you for having me back so soon. I, I, I'm going to take it as a compliment whether you intend it or not. <laughs> wow. Okay, now I feel like I was fishing for a compliment. <laughs> it is great to be back and to open up God's Word with you. Uh, as you know, we're living in, in very difficult days, and it's pretty hot out there. I mean, literally, we're in Texas, just at the tail end of the summer and into the fall season, and it's still hot. But, but spiritually speaking, too, of course, it's a, it's a broken world out there, and, and so it's pretty pretty difficult these days for, for, for the church and for believers to, to shine for Jesus. Well, a few, well, about a month ago or so now, I went out for what I hadn't done in years and years and years, which was I went out for a jog in the, in the Texas heat. Uh, it was time to start doing some exercise, I was told. And uh, so I thought, all right, what could 30 minutes, a 30 minute jog, I, that can't, I can't break a man, I can do that. I'm athletic. Now, you've got to understand that my approach to exercise over the last decade has been to follow my dad's advice. And my dad's advice has been, son, when I feel like doing exercise, I lie down for a nap until the feeling passes. <laughs> I've always thought, hey, who am I to, to disobey dad? That's good advice. But, but about a month or so, it was time to ignore dad's wisdom and, and just head on out and, uh, and live, uh, do the right thing, live a healthy life. And so I did. And, and, and here's the thing. It's hot out there. <laughs> I did not expect it to be so hot. Now, I knew it was hot. When I was sitting in my air-conditioned home, you know, getting ready to go out, but, but out there's hotter than anything I expected. Within a few moments, my mouth was just dry, crust dry. And my, my, my legs were beginning to feel like big, clunky like trunks, tree trunks, just heavy. Uh, my head was starting to get a little dizzy from the sun that was beating on it. And then the, the heat was radiating off the road right back at me. It, it was horrible. My shoes felt like they were made of concrete. And I felt that even the squirrels and the birds were heckling me as I slowly <laughs> ran past them in their little squirrel languages and stuff. It was brutal. It was absolutely brutal. I was doing the right thing in choosing to live the, the healthy life out there, but out there is hostile to, to, to everything I wanted to accomplish in those, in those 30 minutes. Suffice to say that an eternal 15 minutes later, I was right back at home. And I was a sweaty mess, and I was uh, beaming red, and I couldn't cool myself down. I was panting like a dog, and, and I was a broken man. And I just collapsed in a, in a chair there by the, by the kitchen table, and my head sort of sunk onto the table under my arms, and I vowed never, ever again am I ignoring Dad's wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> but I survived the ordeal, obviously, and uh, eventually, as I reflected upon what happened, I realized that a key problem with venturing out into the big, bad, hot out there in a Texas summer was my naivete. I was just naive. I did not expect the level of heat that I encountered, even though I knew it was hot out there. It caught me off guard. My, my expectations were just off, so I was ill-prepared. I really should have gone out there with sunglasses and, you know, a hat to cover my head and, and maybe even to listen to a podcast to drown out my dad's voice every step of the way. Should have taken a nap. Should have taken a nap. That's all I could hear. Don't, don't forget to listen to me. Friends, I went out undiscipled in the ways of Texas summer jogging and it broke me. Of course it did. Who does that? Now, I tell you all of that really by way of analogy because I believe it speaks of how believers uh, go into society to represent Christ undiscipled in expectations that they should have in light of how hostile it is out there. 
Spiritually speaking, it is an anti-Christian society. It's, it's hot. It's difficult. And if you don't expect that, you're going to struggle. You're going to try and do the right thing and live the healthy Christian life, but, but you're going to be confronted with a, with a level of rejection that could ultimately perhaps leave you frustrated or angered or discouraged or disappointed or worse, silenced or sidelined, certainly perhaps broken. Choosing to maybe live out the rest of your days for Jesus, just taking a nap until he returns, which would be highly inappropriate in light of his calling on your life. So what should you expect as a Christian as you head out to jog into society and your neighborhood and your workplace for Jesus? What should you expect? Knowing what's coming as you jog around will certainly help you uh, be prepared for what's going to come at you. You see, the temperature out there is not going to be lowered just simply because you go out with passion to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to understand what the expectations are. And so I think in Acts chapter 14, we have a wonderful little passage of scripture in which we get to learn some of the things we should expect as we serve the Lord, just like Paul and Barnabas did way back then. But this is an interesting little scene. Uh, There's a lot of things going on there. One of the things I love is that God is doing through Paul in this little scene in a a very pagan, Gentile, or or non-Jewish town, what God did through Peter in the religious center of the world at the time, Jerusalem, as he ministered to Jews. And both ended up receiving the same response from society. And it's it's lovely because it helps you see that God is consistent in what he calls generations of believers to do. And society is consistent in their response to that. So we can expect the same things today in the 21st century as, as they did back then. I want to show you five expectations, just five. There are many more expectations that you should have of how society, perhaps your family or co-workers will respond to your witness for Christ. But, but there's five here that I don't want you to miss. And as I said earlier, knowing them is definitely not going to dial down the temperature against you, but it's going to help prepare you in light of the hostility and the heat out there. Sort of it will give you a little hat to wear and sunglasses to put on and maybe a, a sort of a podcast to listen to as you, as you jog around your neighborhood for Jesus. Now, the book of Acts, as you well know, it tells us the spread of the gospel through the church in the early days in a very hostile society. I mean, they're being rejected uh, all, all, all over the place as the gospel spreads from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and then on to the ends of the earth. And, and this little portion of Acts, uh, Acts 14 is in that ends of the earth type of movement of the gospel spread. And we read it, and we read stories like it, and we often see it sort of like a window into another world, where we peer into their lives back then, distant people, distant lands, distant cultures. And that's true. It is a historical account of what happened back then. But, but it's, it's not just that. This is the, the living word of God. This is the living voice of God. And so it's, it's also sort of like a window that you open up to peer into your neighborhood and into your workplace, and into society around here, and and, and, and to see what's going on and know how to live within it. So that's what I want to do. I want to open up this window and help you see not just what's there, but what it says about your life here today. Five expectations. Let's go after the first one. The first one is really simply this. Expect God's intervention in society. Expect God to intervene in society. You can get so discouraged at what's going on out there that you forget that God actually is at work and that he wants to work and that he will work and that he's, he's going to continue to chase after your loved ones and your friends and your co-workers because he's for them. He wants them. They're his originally. Now look at verse 8. Acts chapter 14, verse 8. Now, at Lystra, which is a a little backwater town, it really isn't an important town at all. It's a Gentile, non-Jewish town. At Lystra, there was a man that was sitting 
And, and you read that and you go, that's, that's not a big deal. P -p People sit all the time. Humans like to sit. Look at you all. You're just sitting there, right? We, we do sitting very well. And this guy's sitting, but, but he's not sitting for the same reasons that you and I would perhaps in a place like this. Because it goes on to tell us that he cannot use his feet. He's sitting because he can't use his feet. The language that's used there uh, really is translated as he's powerless in his feet. The root word there actually is interesting. We use it uh, to refer to dynamite, right? Dynamite is explosive. He has no dynamite in his feet. It, they just don't work. That's why he's sitting. He can't do anything but sit. And if you didn't get that, it goes on to tell us because he was crippled from birth literally means that since he was inside his mother's womb, he has not had any power in those legs, in those feet. So he could not use his feet, and he was crippled from birth, and then third time, he had never walked. He had never walked. Three times at the beginning of this little incident, we're told, this guy's sitting because he, he, he can't do anything else. This is a problem. We have a problem here. He can't walk. He never has walked. And he can't ever walk if his life trajectory continues thus far in the direction in which it's been heading. That, that sitting there is an unresolvable problem that this man has. He can't do anything about it. I mean, can you imagine never, never having had feeling in your legs and your feet? And some of you here or watching may have had that experience. Unable to, to, to get up out of bed, unable to, to stand upright and, and to walk and into the kitchen and get yourself a drink. Unable to get out of bed, unable to get out of the house, unable to go to the restroom without somebody assisting you. That's a, that's a tough spot to be in. This is a sad situation that this man finds himself in and he can't fix it. So he can't walk, but he can hear. Look at verse 9. He, that's the crippled man, listened to Paul speaking. If you follow the story of Acts thus far, you'll read about Paul and Barnabas heading into different towns, and what they do there is they speak. And we have quite a lot of their little messages there in the chapters 13 and into 14. And they're preaching the gospel. That's, that's the point of this visit to this backwater town of Lystra. To declare the oracles of God, to preach the good news of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul's presumably declaring that there's a coming kingdom of God where life flourishes, where, where human life flourishes. We, we sang about it earlier, where all is made new, where sin is forgiven because of this King Jesus. And where the blind see and the deaf hear and the mute speak and the crippled can walk. Can you imagine what that man felt when he heard that good news? I want that life. I was made for that life, not this. So he listens to Paul speaking, we're told. And then look at Paul. Paul looks intently at him. And seeing that he had faith to be made well, he said in a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. He sprang up and he began walking. This is beautiful. This is remarkable. Think about it. This guy's never been able to do that. And Paul catches his eyes somehow. And he detects that this man's listening is a certain type of listening. It's a listening that has longing in it. It's a listening that has faith birthed in it. It's a listening that says, I want that. I want to believe that. That is truth. That's the gospel. I want this Jesus. And so God allows Paul to minister to this man a miracle. A supernatural miracle. Because you know this guy can't walk. Three times we're told that he couldn't walk. And yet Paul speaks into his life and the man is able to get up and to walk because God intervened in his life. A little foretaste 
of the kingdom of God. And God does that. In the ministry of Jesus, we see it repeatedly that when Jesus proclaims the gospel or teaches, that often that's accompanied by miraculous activities. It's, it's as though God is saying, hey, let me authenticate the truth of that message through a display of my power. And he does it in the life of Peter, and he, and he does it in the life of Paul here. Now, every time Paul calls a miracle down, people aren't healed. But, but God, in this case, allows that little society to get a little glimpse of the kingdom of God that's coming to authenticate the gospel message that Paul is preaching. It's a, it's a display of the kingdom of God, the new heavens and new earth and life in it, where human life flourishes. It's beautiful. Friends, God wants to intervene. God wants to intervene. God will intervene. God will undo the effects of sin on a human society. And, and this cripple really speaks of a crippled, powerless humanity. You. Me, before Christ. Society, outside of Christ. We, we, society, human society has been crippled from birth. Powerless. Unable to do anything about their condition. Waiting for God to intervene. And he does. Through the proclamation of the gospel through his people who go to places like Lystra. And tell the good news. It's, it's beautiful. So, friends, we, we can expect God's intervention in society today. Don't lose heart. It's hot and noisy out there. They think they've exiled or buried God. But he's willing to work. He wants to work in the lives of your loved ones and your friends at work and college don't ever forget that. Don't give up on anyone. God doesn't. Now look at expectation number two. Expectation number two is really this. Expect misinterpretation of God's work in society. Expect society to misread and misunderstand what God is doing. Look at verse 11. And when the crowds saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices saying in Lycaonian, that's their local language, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. Now those of you who know me from even just a few weeks ago know that I make a big deal out of Barnabas. Right, I've written a book on this guy. This guy is my hero. And so there's lots of stuff that I want to say here that we derail this sermon and turn it into another sermon on Barnabas. So I've got to restrain myself on that. Paul's the main speaker here. That's what's happened. And so when they see what Paul has done and how he has declared his message, they then assume that Barnabas and Paul are gods. And look at verse 13. And so the priest of Zeus whose temple was at the entrance to the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifices with the crowds. These people completely misinterpret what happens there. They, they don't put together the message and the miracle. They take the miracle and then, and then interpret the miracle in light of the lens through which they view reality. Reality. And so they misinterpret what God is doing through Paul. And before you're too hard on them, what you have to understand is that, that society back then had their own little pagan, superstitious, quasi-religious worldview. They, they read this miraculous act through, through the lens that was available to them. You see, they had their pagan sources of authority. Let's call them Bibles with small b. They had the little, their little Bibles through which they, they filtered reality and tried to understand what was there. They had their little bedtime stories that were passed on generationally that, that conditioned them and made them view the world the way they viewed the world. There's one that we know of that's directly applicable to here. They had an ancient story in Lystra, which you can read about, a guy in the first century B.C., 
long before Paul and Barnabas has written about it, and they've discovered archaeologically some, you know, stuff, some texts, some murals, etc. But they had an ancient story where Zeus and Hermes came to Lystra. And they came and society was pretty inhospitable to them, except for an old couple that lived in a, in a little cottage that were very, very poor. And this old poor couple hosted Zeus and Hermes and were hospitable toward them. They fed them. And so impressed were Zeus and Hermes, according to their little stories, that they decided that they were going to spare the life of this couple, even though they were there, to flood the entire area in judgment, which is what they did. But they spared this little couple, and this little couple was essentially granted a wish. And the wish that they requested was that their little cottage would become a temple to Zeus. And that this couple would become the first priesthood that would operate and manage that temple cult. And that they would one day die together so that the other wouldn't see the other's gravestone. And Zeus and Hermes apparently granted them that wish. Now, I, I'm, not, I'm not telling you that because I believe in ancient fairy tales or ancient myths. I'm telling you that because that's why there is a temple to Zeus in this town. With a priesthood. And that's why they're expecting the gods to, recur, or to, to return. And when they see this miraculous event occur via the lips of, and acts of Paul, they think, well... It must be the gods. They must be back. And the last time they were here, we weren't good and we were disciplined for it, so let's be hospitable. So they, the priest rolls out some of their sort of rituals, right? Get an ox. Let's get garlands. Let's have a church service here. And let's worship them. They're, they're trying to understand their existence and the reality that's occurring in front of them through the only lens available to them. It's false, but it's understandable why they would do that. They're lost people. The, the only understanding of, of life that they've had has been passed on through their pagan little Bible story, Small Bay. Society out there is no different, friends. They hear the gospel through a very skewed lens that, that's, that's full of weird filters. Uh, in light of their little secular Bibles that they've been conditioned to believe over the years. So expect society to misunderstand your faith. Expect society to misunderstand what you live for. Expect them to, to misread Jesus' teaching on, on truth and sin and morality and marriage and identity and gender and sexuality and, and salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, in light of the scriptures alone, to the glory of God alone. None of that makes sense to them, even though it's true. I've actually quite a lot of patience and empathy and even compassion for the unbeliever who's trying to make sense of their existence without the gospel, without the light of the scriptures. And I have a lot of frustration with the believer who's try who does have the scriptures and is trying to make sense of, of human life and gender and marriage and identity outside of the Bible according to their own sort of unredeemed quasi-pagan superstitions that they haven't placed at the feet of the cross yet. So friends, expect God to intervene this week through you, through your gospel proclamation, but also expect the society around you to potentially misinterpret it, to misread it. Don't be surprised by that. It leads me to a third expectation that I want you to see. And it's this, expect confusion on truth in society out there. As you go around jogging for Jesus this week, expect them to, to be confused about the truth that you're proclaiming. Expect them to be frustrated by it, perhaps. Look at verse 14. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, heard 
Remember, these guys had said in their Lyconian language, these are gods that come to us and they're doing their little churchy rituals. So when Paul and Barnabas catch wind of what actually is occurring, they tore their garments and they rushed out into the crowd crying. And here we have a little summary sermon that, that they, they deliver then. Verse 15, man, why are you doing these things? We're also men of like nature with you, and we, we bring you good news, we bring you gospel. And here it is, that you should turn from these vain things to a living God. Turn from those vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. Yet he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Verse 18, but even with these words, they, were, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifice to them. There's a whole bunch there that I can't get into. But, but here's really the, the gist of what's occurring. Paul and Barnabas, when they catch wind that these people are turning this act of God's intervention into a worship service to them, they try to put a stop to it. And the only way they can do it is by tearing their clothes as if to say, that's blasphemy. Let's not do that. And then they deliver a message. And the, the message simply says, there is a living God. And that living God is a giving God. And he's also a forgiving God. So turn. Repent. Turn for your, from your worthless ways of living. That's what that, that language, that vain things, that's what that means. Useless things. Worthless things. Verse 15 there has a key component of the gospel. You should turn from these vain things and worthless things to a living God. That's what repentance means. I've been living going in this direction in life. And, and, and God calls me to head in this direction in life. It's a full U-turn. You can't, you can't understand the gospel and you're not delivering the gospel if you don't call people to turn. But that gets confusing for them. That's what triggers a shift in this little incident. He's central to that message of, of repentance and turning to the real God. It is what could cause offense. And it is offensive. What you've been taught since you were this side. The little bedtime stories that mum and dad told you about life were wrong. It's a challenge, right, on, on everything they have known to be true. And that's, that's tough to accept, even though it's necessary for them to accept. It's a direct challenge uh, to, to their worldview. And so Paul goes at it, but verse 18 tells us that even with these words, they scarcely restrain the people from offering sacrifice to them. It's, it's kind of going in one ear and out the other ear at this point. It's hard to restrain a society that's in a hot frenzy. And yet we must. So expect confusion. Expect frustration as it relates to issues of truth out there this week. They're, they're just trying to make sense of their existence without truth. Our gospel challenges it and calls it worthless because it is. And it calls them to repent. So God wants to intervene and he will. And society will misunderstand his activities and even be confused by the truth that it proclaims. Number four, fourth expectation for you to take into this week is this, expect persecution in society. Expect persecution, expect resistance, expect some sort of subtle resistance or some sort of aggressive agitation. If you don't expect that, I don't know what Bible you are reading. It's very clear that the way of Christ in a fallen world until the new heavens and new earth is not going to be easy for the one who tries to shine the light of the Lord Jesus Christ and deliver the gospel. And so you should expect persecution in society. Look at verse 19. 
But Jews came from Antioch and from Iconium. That's the two previous towns where Paul and Barnabas had been ministering. So they came, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. Anti-gospel agitators show up everywhere, back then and today. Today, probably more through the lens or the uh, manifestation of very aggressive identity groups, right, that are, that are, that are challenging the gospel and they're, they're calling it an affront on human rights. They're not happy with a call to repent, to turn. Paul experienced that. Barnabas experienced that. These, these guys come along and, and they persuade the crowds, which means they preach their gospel. They preach their false gospel. They have a message for these people. And, and this confused society is so fickle that it, it suddenly turns from worshiping Paul to stoning Paul. That's how quickly a society will turn. I mean, they know how to turn, but not to God. They turn on Paul. In Pisidian Antioch, which was one of the cities that they were at previously, the crowd there, uh, most of the crowd there, uh, wanted to get rid of Paul and Barnabas, and so they left. When When they got to Iconium, the crowd there rejected them and wanted to stone them, but they didn't. And now we get to Lystra, and the crowd ends up stoning Paul. So there's a progression in persecution that we see occurring here. Persecution wears lots of different faces. Comes in all different shapes and sizes. I don't know if you've ever been hit on the head with a stone. My guess is it's pretty painful. I was hit in the head once by a rugby ball and it dazed me. Like I was nearly on my knees saying, Lord, I'm ready. Take me home. A a, a martyr's death on the rugby field. Can you imagine what went on there? I mean, they were about to worship him. And now they're flinging stones at him. And can you imagine what it would take and what hatred one would have within them to actually fire a stone at somebody's head? And then another? And then another? This is brutal. It looks like Paul is dead, so they drag him out of the city and, uh, and they leave him there. Friends, all I want you to understand really is that you have to expect persecution out there. You've got to expect society to be offended or challenged by the truth that you proclaim. They, don't, they, they resist the gospel. Of course they do. It, it calls them to turn from everything they've ever known. And remember, they're crippled. They, they've only ever known not standing up straight, walking. Time is gone. Let me give you expectation number five. This is my favorite one. And it comes at the very end of this a little scene and it's beautiful and it's this expect help in the church expect help from the people of God this is your family I know that you might not know one another but your family and it's important that you regularly gather as family God says that elsewhere Because this family is your support network as you then go out into a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday representation of Christ in society. This family is God's provision to help you, to refresh you. Participate here. Grow here. God's help in the world is mediated through his help to his people and his people out into the world. And we're dangerously close to messing up what it means to be the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in the 21st century in ways that other generations, 2,000 years of generations of believers haven't before us. Expect help in the church. Look at verse 20. I love it. But when the disciples gathered about him, that is around Paul, he rose up and entered the city And on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. I I love this little verse. It's, It's amazing. Here's what I need you to understand. It says, when the disciples gathered, and the question you should be asking is, 
Who's the disciples? It's not the twelve. And we know that, that Paul and Barnabas came to this town alone. Now, John Mark had been with them, but he had already left them. And we also know in the book of Acts that the word disciples is another word for Christians, believers. It seems to me that as Paul preached that gospel message, and then as Paul preached the second gospel message of the, of the living, giving, forgiving God, some believed in that society. Some people out there actually listened like the little crippled listened with faith and received the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when Paul gets stoned, they go to him to help him immediately. We know that, I, I like to think that one of them was the crippled man who can now walk, right? He believed through faith and I believe he probably was one. But we also know from Paul's second missionary journey when he heads back to this city that there is a little community of believers there and that there is a family and one of the most well-known men in Christian history was part of that family, part of that town, probably believed here and his name is Timothy. So there's lots of beautiful things that are emerging out of here. But I need you to see that God's people help they help one another. They help society. They don't hurt one another. And they don't hurt society. And because of the church's help, Paul gets right back up and goes right back in to jog around the streets of Lystra. That same day. He's not going to give up on them. He doesn't back off. So don't miss what the gathered disciples can do to you. And what the gathered disciples means for society. That's the sort of help I hope you get in this church and that you make sure others get in this church. It's, it's, it's exactly what happened to me when I returned from that first eternal 15-minute jog in the Texas summer a month ago. I kid you not, I had my little gathered disciple moment that resurrected me from my broken mess. You recall I was panting like a dog. I was lying sort of flat on the kitchen table, uh, just a broken man, uh, vowing never to do that again and making sure that I never ignored my dad again and his great words of wisdom. Uh, nobody was there. The family wasn't there except one, my youngest, the seven-year-old. He was in the living room when I came in. And he didn't say a word, but he knew I was a mess. And as I lay sort of half dead on that table... I could hear him moving around me and sort of opening cupboards and, and then going in and out of the garage, which is right beside where I was. And, and eventually, without saying a word, I felt a cool breeze blowing right in my direction. And I lifted my head and there he had set up on a chair a portable fan that he plugged in. And off he went to do his own little thing that he was doing. Never said a word. His eyes were open to my need. And he met it. He was my little verse 20 of Acts 14 gathered disciple. And here's the thing. It so encouraged me that every other day since I have gone out for a 20 minute jog around my neighborhood. And I smile at the squirrels when they heckle me. That's what the church can do for you. And that's what we as a church can do for a crippled and broken and lost society. Trying to understand their existence in their lostness with all the junk and falsehoods that Satan has sprinkled into the soil of the culture around us. Friends, God is at work God wants to work this week. Don't forget that. He's after your friends. He's after your family members, some of whom perhaps at one point came here. He's not going to give up on them. And so you cannot give up on them. Expect him to intervene this week. But expect society to not understand what you stand for. Expect them to be confused by that, perhaps even aggressively agitated by it. They're lost. They're in darkness. Show some compassion mixed in with the firm, bold proclamation of the truth. But also expect the church 
to help. You know, difficulty and hostility is not new for the Christian church. We don't have it any worse than anybody who's lived before us. It's nearly, it's nearly the history of Christianity is a, is a history of conflict and persecution and hostility. That's not new. But we have a message to proclaim in Jesus Christ. The living and giving and forgiving God who loves the world. And we, like Paul heading back into Lystra this week, can go in and proclaim that message well. Let me close in prayer, friends. And uh, when I end it, I want you to remain seated. I'm, it's my understanding that's your custom in the last few weeks to sing together as you exit and go into the world to represent the Lord. So Alan's going to come up and lead us in that just after I pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We, we thank you, Lord, for how relevant it is. It speaks to our day. It inserts direction from you for us in our situations. And I pray that you would help us to be prepared to go into our Monday knowing what to expect and yet being willing to do so Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday as well. And Lord, I pray that if there's somebody in this a congregation or who's been listening through the broadcast that has never listened to the gospel with faith, that they will do so right now. That they will understand that you love them. That you want to give them eternal life your way. And your way is by grace alone, through faith alone and Christ alone, as the scriptures alone teach us and for the glory of God alone. Thank you for the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.